I'll tell you, the key to pressing heavy weights overhead is you've got to train the lift yeah. rather frequently. If you're going to be you're going to be a good presser, you're going to have to do some pressing four days a week. Hello, hello. Mike Matthews here from Muscle for Life and Legion Athletics back with another episode of the Muscle for Life podcast. Now, I know I've been saying this every week for several weeks now, but I apologize for my absence. It's not because I have given myself over to uh, Fortnite or Netflix. It is because I have been working seven days a week, many hours a day on the third editions of both Bigger, Leaner, Stronger and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, as well as their accompanying workout journals, the year one challenges for men and women, respectively. And I'm pretty excited to announce that I am at the tail end of the entire project. I will have everything wrapped up by the end of next week, including the recording of the audiobooks, which is what I'm working on basically all day, every day right now for the last couple of weeks. Recording audiobooks is a slog, I will tell you. But it also makes for the best final draft because you have to read every single word of your manuscript slowly and deliberately, which forces you to really consider every single word and every single sentence. So anyways, I've been giving that project basically all of my attention for the last six to eight weeks or so because I want the books out. I want these new third editions out in December. And to do that, I had to work on a very difficult and tight deadline, basically. But the good news is it looks like we're on target to release these third editions in December. The digitals will definitely be out by then. The eBooks and audiobooks, absolutely. The hard copies, probably. If the printer can do me a favor and get them done a little bit faster than usual, then yep, the hard copies will also be out in December. And I'm super excited because I, I mean, my intention with these books, honestly, is to create the best fitness books ever written for men and women. That, that was my goal going into it. Whether I've achieved that or not will be up to you and everybody else, but I can say they are the absolute best books I can create right now for men and women. I'm really happy with how everything came together. And even if you've read the first editions and the second editions, you are going to really enjoy the third editions. Uh, you're going to learn new stuff. You're going to get clarifications on things that I feel like I didn't quite explain as well as I could have in the second editions and the programs are getting tweaked they're not changing too much but they are getting tweaked based on my experience working with thousands of people uh, just over the internet and getting a ton of feedback so obviously i'll be talking more about the books as we get closer to their release but i just wanted to let you know that that's what i've been buried in for the last 68 weeks or so and by the end of next week more or less all of my work will be done on those projects and then i'm going to get back to the normal routine of writing on the blogs recording more podcasts and so forth i'm looking forward to it honestly because while i really enjoy researching and writing books i don't exactly enjoy taking what would normally be a year's worth of work or so and cramming it into like two to three months <laughs> Anyways, let's get to the point. What is today's podcast about? Well, today's is another interview with one of my favorite guys in the fitness space, the grandfather of barbell training, Mark Ripito, who has given us many great things, including books that everyone should read, like Starting Strength and Practical Programming. As you can tell, of course, I'm a fan of Mark's work because nobody has done more to promote, teach, and defend barbell training than Rip. And he's also always fun to talk to thanks to his peppery personality. He does not mince words. He shoots from the hip and I appreciate that. This time around, Mark and I talk about pressing, specifically bench and overhead pressing and all of their variations and subtleties. Now, these two exercises are two of the best that you can do for gaining strength and muscle. It's not a stretch to say that the stronger you get on these exercises, the 
happier you're going to be with how you look above the waist. Now, there are a number of factors beyond your control that influence how well you can bench an overhead press, like the length of your limbs, your bone structure, how tall you are and so forth. But there are also many things that you can control, like your technique and training methods. And these are what you're going to learn about in today's interview with Mark. Whether you're new to the bench and overhead press or just trying to add a few more pounds to your powerlifting totals, I think you're going to find today's episode helpful because Mark and I discuss a number of common questions that I get at least, like should you do incline bench press if you're already doing the flat bench press? Should you do a wide or close grip bench press? Should you arch your back a lot or a little or none at all? Should you do seated or standing overhead press? Should you do the overhead press or the military press and more? So the bottom line is by the end of this interview, you're going to know more about the bench and overhead press than 90% of the people in your gym, including the trainers. Mr. Ribatel, thank you. Hi, Mike. How are you, man? Uh, you know. Um, Been a while. Yep, yep. Things are, things are going, though. Things are, the country's still here, so that's good. That's, that's, well, for now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I thought, uh, I thought we would mix it up and maybe talk about some popular culture. Like who's your favorite, uh, degenerate on, uh, the bachelor. What's the bachelor. Yeah, it's a show. See, we can't talk about popular culture with me. I don't watch television. So. <laughs> I actually don't either. I just know I, it's, a, I, I know it's a thing. It's a show yeah. where there's a guy and, yeah. uh, I think they also so have, a, married, they have the apparently. female version. Yeah. So it's a guy and a bunch of girls chasing after. Then they have the female version where it's a girl. It's it's a bunch of degenerates being degenerates, basically. Is it uh, like reality TV or is it like yeah, but a it's situation fake. comedy? No, it's all oh, scripted. It's all you know, I had this discussion. Yeah. I had this discussion with um, a buddy of mine's girlfriend who is, she's into one of them. I don't remember the bachelor. The bachelorette is the female version of it where Jesus. it's uh, it's the girl and all the guys are chasing after the girl. And, and she was trying, and I was like, you do realize all of this is fake, right? Like every single aspect of this is scripted. And then she was trying to argue, no, no, this is, wait, oh no, they wouldn't do that to me. Yeah, that's, that's, that's oh, the appeal. No, no. That's, that's what makes it so great is it's just, it's real. It's spontaneous. It's real, like, man. This is, like, really? this is the you way people actually, actually behave. Yeah. You actually yeah. think that? Wow. Okay. If, if, if this is, if. Same if, thing with if, like Kardashians and that stuff. Of course, it's all scripted. It's all fake. Of course, it is. What? How? You got to make it interesting. It, they're like, you can't just wing it and hope you get stuff. You need to script everything, and you know, be very does this, deliberate. Does this girl also go to uh, WWE? I wonder if she thinks that's real too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's probably actually more real. <laughs> at least you have to. At least, yeah, at least, I mean, at least the, the guy does fly through the air. Exactly. You know? The acrobatics and the athletics <laughs> are, are real. It's just a, it's an athletic male soap opera is all that shit is. So, yeah. Uh, yeah there's well, some girls too, I guess. All right, fine. So I haven't watched gonna... that in a long time either. Yeah, so no, that's not good. All right, so fine. All right, so we we're not going to talk, gonna about, talk about that. Let's talk about bench pressing yeah. and overhead pressing then instead. Okay. That all sounds right. like fun. All right, so let's let's start with bench pressing, and um, I want to follow the same format as the the previous two with uh, squatting, and deadlifting, where I'm just going to kind of throw some questions your way that I'm often asked uh, on how to bench and overhead press properly, okay. and then okay. you can rant and rave. All right, cool. All right, so let's start. With I know the, how to do that. <laughs> let's start with uh, bench press, and let's start okay. with flat pressing versus incline pressing versus decline pressing. All right. Well, I think that if you're gonna if you're gonna bench press, that uh, you ought to do uh, the the version of the bench press that uses the most muscle mass. Uh, incline leaves stuff out. Decline leaves stuff out. Plus the fact that decline's got an extremely a shortened range of motion. And there's not really any way to do it uh, without the profound risk of being guillotined by a dull bar. And so I don't see a reason for any human to do a decline bench press. Uh, and uh, as far as the, like putting up more weight than you can actually handle and trying to look strong. Yes, certainly. It's just, it's a partial bench is what it is. Just a partial bench. You want to do partial benches, just do partial benches. 
make up some excuse like call them floor presses or whatever you want to do. Uh, just reduce the range of motion and use an artificially high amount of weight. Fine. That makes you happy. Go ahead and do that. Incline, I was going to say, is uh, unnecessary because if you're doing the flat bench and you're doing the press, then everything's covered. Uh, now, there are some shoulder injuries. Mine is not one of them. Uh, that uh, mitigate in favor of an incline press. I know some people that can incline press without a great deal of pain, uh, whereas a, a regular bench press bothers their shoulder. For persons like that, then, yeah, go ahead and incline. Uh, but for the general training public, for beginners, for novices, as we call them, I think that if you're doing both the press and the bench press that you've got all your bases covered. And I see no reason to, um, you know, doll this up any more than that. I, I'm a big believer in uh, simplicity, and I, I see no argument for anything for the vast majority of trainees other than the bench press and the press. Okay. And what are your thoughts on incline pressing for putting a little bit more emphasis on the clavicular uh, clavicular? part mm -hmm. of the pec major which I, the I, clavicular part of the the reason why i bring that pec, up fine. is that's bodybuilding i don't really give a shit okay, about fine. that it's that's, that's why if, I bring that up. if you're trying to fill in that that uh, subclavicular pec belly hey go ahead and incline it it probably works because it takes so much of the inferior aspect of the pec out of the movement pad yeah and, you know, this is all dependent on angle, but by the same token, you know, a heavy press does the same yeah. thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So the reason why I bring that up is because, I mean, I ran into myself uh, when I was younger, just doing, I did a lot of uh, benching, of course. I never trained legs because why would you train legs? But I uh, did a lot of benching and, uh, and I, the way that my chest developed was a bit bottom heavy because the the upper portion of the of the muscle was a little bit underdeveloped and what helped balance that and it's probably genetic yeah but it did but doing a lot of incline pressing which i was uh, I, I mean i did a lot did. over the course of i would say six to eight months um in in a mostly i think most of that time in, in a slight surplus if i remember correctly like doing it right it made a uh -huh. it made a noticeable difference like i you know i have pictures uh, and I look before and after. So, um, and you know, from an aesthetics, oh, I'm not, from I'm an aesthetics, side, that uh, it does work. I find that in, in working with a lot of guys that are, that care, yeah, they want to be strong, but they also want to be pretty. They want to have pretty, pretty pecs. Um, it seems that the, the, the pecs just seem to be kind of a stubborn muscle group, uh, in terms of at least visual development and some incline pressing can help with that. Well, uh, I don't doubt that it can, uh, but first, uh, you know, I'm not a bodybuilding coach and I'm really not entitled to an opinion about that, but more important than that, I personally prefer the look of older bodybuilders like John Grimmick over more modern bodybuilders like Ferrigno, who had great big fluffy peck bellies. I don't, I, I don't think aesthetically that big pecs on a male or that, or, or, or I don't think they're aesthetically yeah. pleasing. If I was, you know, I think it's real easy to train the pecs with a whole bunch of high rep bench pressing. And I think a lot of people overdo the pecs. I see it. I prefer a more balanced yeah, I agree. physique. Uh, if I've got a present, uh, a preference for a male physique, I prefer uh, the pre- bench press emphasis bodybuilder physique as opposed to the post bench press emphasis. So the guys back in the, uh, you know, from Ridge Park on back, that that looks better to me than than a, a guy with big fluffy pecs. I no, I agree. Like I agree. Look. That's actually so, one of the reasons because, you know. And, a, and, and I have, you know, I have never been able to comfortably perform an inclined press. Those things have always hurt my shoulders for 35 years the damn things have hurt my shoulders and i just haven't done them in a very Fair. long time this is before i had shoulder surgery the the damn things that bother my shoulders and you know and those of you listening some you know look if inclines bother your shoulders don't do them 
If they don't bother your shoulders and you want to do them and flat benches, there are occasionally guys, like I mentioned, that, that flat benches bother their shoulders, uh, just incline. See how strong you can get on the incline. The, the primary difference between the two exercises, in, in, as far as I'm concerned, is the kinetic chain of the exercise. If you are standing on the ground holding a barbell in your hands and pressing it upward, you're not leaning on a bench. The kinetic chain is your hands all the way down to the floor, which means that your abs and your low back are uh, actually involved in the exercise where that's, you know, they're, those things are basically asleep in the bench press. And uh, I think that the, the, one of the primary contributions that, that starting strength has made to physical culture over the past 10 years is that we've basically single-handedly reintroduced the press, the standing overhead press. I just call it the press because uh, that's what it is. It's the press. Uh, back into the gym and, uh, you know, the, a, a nice layback Olympic press is a beautiful athletic movement. It involves way more muscle mass than the bench press does. Uh, the fact that, uh, uh, it's being done with a lot of lighter weights than the bench press in my mind is not a, a particular drawback. I mean, the days of human males pressing 400 are pretty much gone. Although, I'll have to tell you that our young Chase Lindley here in the uh, here in the gym that works for us is a pretty good presser. He's pressed 330. Wow. Standing press 330 at a body weight of 240. Wow. Which is a pretty damn good press. Yeah, it's impressive. And the other day, he did a set of pin presses from right at the forehead with 350 for a set of five. The the boy is going to fuck around and, bench and, and press 400 before it's over with. And uh, he's 19. Wow. So, uh, you know, it can't be done. You just have to train it. He's been training with us since he was 12, and – you know, he just thinks that what we do up here is normal. So, you know, he, he's expected to press over 300. And so he does. Uh, it's uh, 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 a lost art. The standing press is a lost art. Yeah. And uh, I mean, starting strength is what got me pressing years ago. I had never done it before. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, I know, man, it's a, you know, till we started writing about it. Till we published it in all three editions of the book and incorporated it as a as the other major upper body exercise, it just wasn't being done very much. And uh, you know, you see some strong men do it. Some strong man competitors are doing the silly ass log press thing. And there's there's some of those boys who've gotten real real strong. But as far as uh, three thirty at a body weight of uh, two forty. There aren't many of them doing that. Yeah, that's some serious strength. I've never seen more than 275 in the you gym know. for uh, so somebody who's put that up for sets of three or four, which I was uh, – that, that impressed me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's an impressive press in 2018. Now, back a long time ago, back in the day, as it were, back in the 50s, early 60s, before the invention of powerlifting and the emphasis on the bench press – a uh, body weight press for a male was that was just baseline. Yeah, and that's and that's that's you know, uh, that's everybody. Yeah, everybody could do that. You know, you can't press body weight. Well, you son, you better get caught up. That took me a fair amount of work to get up to. Uh, I was surprised at how difficult it was, and it's probably oh, partially because of my I have crazy long monkey arms. That doesn't help, but it was hard to get up to one uh, nineties, uh, even for sets of two. Yeah, it's a, it's really, it's quite an achievement because back then those guys started doing that when they were kids and just pressing overhead. And I'll tell you, the key to pressing heavy weights overhead is you've got to train the lift yeah. rather frequently. If you're going to be, you're going to be a good presser, you're going to have to do some pressing four days a week. Because of the, the skill acquisition, the technical component of it? it it's extremely technical. 
a one centimeter out of line on the bar path and it's a miss. Yep. Yep. The thing is controlled. It's an extremely difficult mechanical problem. If you increase the length of, of the moment arm between the barbell and your shoulder by the slightest little bit more than you can tolerate, you miss the lift. And so this, the, the bar path has got to really, really be firmly established and it's got to be worked on. It's got to be practiced and it's got to be trained real heavy. You've got to do some heavy partials. You've got to go, you know, get used to locking heavier weights out overhead than you actually can start off the shoulders. You've got to, uh, get comfortable with the idea that your low back and your abs are going to be under one hell of a bunch of stress. They have to get strong. Your abs get a gigantic workout during the, during a heavy press workout. Uh, you've got to learn to control your knee position or you're going to be doing a push press and that's red lights. You've got to, you, the thing involves the whole body all the way down to the floor. And it's an extremely uh, skill dependent movement pattern. And it is, and, and a lot of people don't appreciate this until you've been training it quite a while. The press is also extremely dependent on psych. You can't just wander under the bar, take it out of the rack, and casually press the damn thing. It won't go. If it doesn't come out of the rack and it doesn't feel good as it comes out of the rack, if it doesn't, if it doesn't feel light coming out of the rack, in other words, if you're not revved up a little bit, you haven't got the right breath as you take it out of the rack. You haven't got a little bit of central nervous system excitation going on. You're going to miss. Yeah. I've experienced that. It's funny you say that. I've experienced that where exactly that, where if it's heavy, it feels off. Like I know it's not heavy because I did this last week and I'm not even, maybe I'm not even trying to progress in weight. I'm just trying to get an extra rep and I'm like, it just doesn't feel right. And then I, I'll, I'll miss my, I'll miss my reps by two or something and be like, what the hell is that? Right. You're just not all the way awake. You've got to get, you've got to get into the movement. You've got to make a little noise. You've got to get under it. You've got to stamp your feet. You've got to rev up a little bit to press. Yeah. You can't just casually press. Whereas with squatting, you I've know? had it where I, I'm walking uh, right off the bar work. and it feels heavy, but then it I get, feels like shit. And you say, okay, well, here, here and we you go. You take a big breath and you go down and you get the set anyway. But a press just won't, you can't bullshit your way through a press like that. You know? Interesting. You just can't do it. You know, you're going to, if, if everything is not tight, Everything is not in exactly the right position. The bar path is going to go out of line. If the bar runs out in front of you, you're done. If you can't hold that thing close to your face all the way up, then you're done. You're not going to make the rep. Yep. You're certainly as hell not going to get the last two reps of a set of five. If the thing, if the, if, if you're loose, you're not, you're not absolutely in the moment. You know, everything else out of your mind, concentrating on making this thing feel light. The first three reps of a set of five are going to use you up and you will not get the last two. It's a, it's, it's strange of all of the lifts, including the Olympic lifts, the, the, the psych component of the press stands out to me. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. None, none of the rest of them are, are nearly as dependent on that. It's a mind game. It certainly is. You have to be, you have to learn to focus on it. You have to learn to reproduce these conditions every time you take a heavy press out of the rack, or it's just going to lay there. I've experienced it. Um, let's, yep. uh, let's, I mean, those is all actually, uh, that's definitely good information on the press. Let's go back to bench press though, and then let's, then let's, uh, flip, flip over to, to OHP. Um, that was actually going to be bar path was going to be one of my questions. So we actually then, uh, <laughs> talked about it but back to the back to the bench press for a few more questions um grip width what are your thoughts well my thoughts on grip width are uh, derived from what are we trying to do with the exercise if we're trying to bench press as much weight as we can then what we want to do like if we're at a meet then what you want to do is uh probably going to be a little bit wider grip width 
then what you would do is if you're if you're trying to just use the bench press as a as a strength exercise. And the reason I say that is I as follows. Yeah, how come? Just just to clarify. The, to clarify that, the IPF rules state that the maximum permissible legal competition bench press grip width is 32 inches and whatever that is in centimeters. All right. Now, if you're a 104 pound female and you're, you know, 411, the rule does not stipulate that your grip width is any narrower than the super heavyweight guy weighing, you know, 330. But the difference in anthropometry is going to turn those two lifters into completely different creatures performing that movement pattern. Uh, a 330-pound man uh, with a 32-inch maximum width grip is going to be very close to vertical forearms at the bottom. A 104-pound female at 4'11", may be able to get the barbell out of the rack, uh, unshrug her shoulders without even bending her elbows, and then shrug back up into a lockout position, having moved the bar an inch. And obviously those movements are not comparable. Right. One is a different thing than the other. Yet both of them are considered bench presses by the IPF. So in my opinion... Uh, for training purposes, we want to use the longest range of motion around the shoulder, which means that the grip you take yields a vertical forearm when the bar touches your chest. And just play that little piece of geometry in your head. You know, you yet that's as far down as your elbows can go if your forearm is vertical. Right, and just so people, just so people can uh, can picture that. So your your forearm could be. I mean, I guess you could also think of it in terms of uh, in, in relation to to your upper arm, right? So so it'd be a, a ninety degree angle as opposed to. No, no, no. The the angle probably the angle at the elbow will be determined by chest height. Well, sure, but you you get to you would but, get to a point where you could you could have a ninety degree angle. Whereas if you had your forearms in, you would never get there. You you'd always have an acute angle, right? Well, it's uh, and maybe, maybe mean, that maybe it, that doesn't even practically <laughs> speaking a, a close grip bench, an extremely close grip bench is so hard on the wrists. Most people don't really do those. Yeah, uh, a close grip bench. Uh, and, and you know, most decent benchers are, are close gripping 90, 92% of their actual competition bench press anyway. Right. Uh, but now what I'm saying is that when you lower the bar and it touches your chest, the, the greatest amount of downward travel at the elbow and therefore the greatest amount of humoral angle expression on the way down is in is presented with a vertical forearm, which means that most people are going to take a grip about a hand width out from the inside, the 16 and a half inch bare spot on the inside of a power bar. Okay. About a hand width out into the nerve. Yeah, no, I was just trying to help people visualize. When you say vertical forearm, it's, it's like a straight yes. up and down. If someone were behind you. Someone is behind you. Right the, uh, right down the head you. judge sitting behind you would see vertical forearm. Right, right. And from, from both the top and from the side. Yeah. Okay. And that would yield the greatest range of motion around the shoulders. And this would therefore be the grip we would select to use for a person who is just strength training with the bench press. All right. There's nothing to be, there's nothing to be obtained in terms of strength wise by reducing the range of motion of the movement. So if you want to reduce the range of motion and take a real wide grip, well, we don't care how much we're benching because we're not competitive. And, lifters. And you see people doing that. Sure. You do that. You see people doing that in, uh, in just, sure. you know, random, course, random consumer kind of gym. Sure you do. Gyms. Because, you know, they're, they're just dumb. 
You know, they hadn't really thought about it. Or, and what we we run everything or, or just, through the greatest amount of our, our criteria for all these lifts are the 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 you want to involve the greatest amount of muscle mass in the exercise that you can that allows you to use the greatest amount of weight on the bar move through the longest effective range of motion so that that's one, two, and three, so that you can get four as strong as you can using that exercise. So if we're going to bench press for strength, then we bench press with a grip that produces a vertical forearm at the bottom. Now, in my opinion, if I were running the International Powerlifting Federation, and when you can go on YouTube and find a world record bench press by a tiny little girl where the bar moved an inch. I'd be concerned with the public perception of exactly what the hell she's doing because that's clearly not the same uh, effort put into the bench press by a, a large male who actually has to move the barbell. Right. So I think that what would benefit powerlifting more than anything they could do besides just getting rid of the bench press, which they're not going to do. Uh, I think that, that a technical rules change that states that the head judge must observe that the forearms are vertical when the barbell touches the chest of the lifter. Now, that's easy enough to implement. It's exactly the same type of a call as a depth call on a squat. And I realize that most federations don't judge depth anymore, but the ones that do, the judge is responsible for making that judgment call. What's wrong with doing the same thing in the bench press and making the judges observe the lifter use a vertical forearm as the bar touches the chest and just turn on the red lights. That way, she's got to do a movement that looks a whole lot closer to what he's doing. And then there's no confusion in the minds of people that are observing this, exactly what the hell is going on. Here. And not only that, but then she has to do uh, the same type of movement that other women that she'd be competing against have to do, because if they don't right. have uh, you yeah. know, the, the anatomy that right. she has, well, they're just at a disadvantage. Sorry. Yeah. You know, and everybody then from that point on, everybody's doing the same right. bench press. Yeah, you've got some people with more flexible backs. You can get a big higher arch. Well, that can't be helped. Right. You know, but at least we take the effect of grip width out of the equation. Because if everybody is responsible for using a vertical forearm at the bottom, then everybody's grip width must generate that vertical forearm so you don't get to cheat the movement by by using this ultra wide grip if you're a small person right now i in my opinion and and the same thing goes for the sumo deadlift that should have been dealt with back in 1981 uh, by a technical rules committee meeting on monday morning after the first guy did the sumo at the world's and they should have amended the rule right then to say the deadlift shall be performed with the grip on the bar outside the stance. And that way, little tiny girls uh, can't set world records by pulling the bar two inches. <laughs> it's just, it's just, that's stupid. It just really is stupid. And I, I I don't see the point in in not making these rules changes because it would it would help the sport it really would yeah I'm sure. Speaking of uh, arch, what are your thoughts on bench press? How much arch should you have in your in your back and and why why arch? Well, I think that you know I, most people are limited in their ability to arch. Hyper flexible females can all show quite a bit more thoracic and lumbar overextension than you and I can. You know, I think most people can get enough lumbar arch and thoracic arch to where you can shove your hand under the under the small of their back when they're on the bench. 
And I, I think since everybody can do it that way, that's that's probably fine. But I don't think that they're I, you would if you're going to start monkeying around with the rules, you're going to have to do it one step at a time. I can't think of a quantitative way to fix a, a big, huge arch sure. on a hyper flexible FEMA. Yeah. The, the grip with things are easy. You could just arbitrarily right. ban her. <laughs> you could just be like, ah, could. nah, go away. <laughs> yeah, just turn the red lights on. Well, why did I get a red light? Uh, you know, because just go away. <laughs> because get out of here. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> you know, that's why. So, but no, yeah. just for the everyday person, though, should they be trying to arch, achieve as much arch as possible or, or the standard? And, you know, if you can get a tennis ball under there, you're good to go. I think that the primary thing that a person ought to be doing when they bench is to adduct the shoulder blades and get the chest up. And the reason you want to do that is because it uh, it's kind of a complicated mechanical thing that we, we cover in the book. And I can, I can summarize it probably uh, for you here by just saying that if you have your shoulders, shoulder impingement is the, is the issue. I'm trying to think of the best way to introduce this topic. Shoulder impingement uh, occurs when you have an extreme amount of abduction at the humerus with regard to the glenohumeral joint. Um, if, if, if you sit up in your chair right now and raise your elbows up straight to the side, then when your elbow approaches, when your humerus approaches about- Just, just to interject, just people listening, that is ab abduction, right? Moving away from the middle. Yeah, moving away from the middle. And AD, you've probably heard of adduct, is in, yeah. Adduction is in. So when your elbows are down laying on your latch, you're adducted. And when they're out at 90 degrees to the side, they are abducted. At approximately 90 degrees of abduction, you are going to feel a sensation in your shoulder. And that sensation is produced by the entrapment of the rotator cuff tendons between the head of the humerus, and the inferior aspect of the acromioclavicular joint. And I would, I would say if this people want shoulder. to see this, if they want to visualize this, just, oh. just, just Google AC there's, joint and you'll see. Uh, and there's an illustration in, in the book that perfectly illustrates this point. Okay. So what we recommend as far as a bench press uh, per angle at from the humerus to the to the midline of the body is about 70 degrees because that removes all the impingement. What that does do, though, is drop the elbow down relative to the shoulder. And this produces a moment arm that has to be dealt with that exists between the barbell and the shoulder joint. And the price you pay for reducing that moment arm through uh elbow position is you're going to impinge your shoulders and bench presses sometimes are hard on the, on the shoulders because of this. So we recommend 70 degrees of abduction instead of 90. The mechanical price you pay for that is that there now exists a little moment arm between the barbell and the shoulder joint that you have to overcome when you press. That's why the bar path and the bench press is not a straight vertical line. It's a curve. And it curves from the chest back up to the shoulders because the lockout position is directly over the glenohumeral joint and hmm. the bar contact on the chest is down below that. So there's about a three inch moment arm there that's going to have to be. So built. it's kind of like a little bit of a, of a, of a J kind of motion. Yes. Well, they're not, no, really it's just a, just a straight curve. It's not a, it's not a J it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, you know, just a kind of a slightly. Well, if you take a tip or, away, yeah, it just, it comes, yeah, it comes, it comes in and then it comes up. Right. They, everybody can understand this. So <clears throat> one of the things that you can do to mitigate that moment arm is to get your chest up. So you're going to rotate uh, your chest up. And in doing so, you rotate your shoulders back under the bar. 
so that a person that knows how to do this can get a pretty vertical bar path back out of the bench press, even with the elbows down at 70 degrees of abduction. And uh, again, it's hard to visualize this verbally without being able to draw it. Uh, all I can tell you is that it's in the bench press chapter of the book and it's beautifully illustrated and it, 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 it shows you exactly the concept you need to know and why and explains the mechanics of all this. Yes. And so that's why you need to arch your chest. Okay. And that, that also it's ties in turn efficient mechanics to your bench press Thanks. and prevent shoulder impingement. Right. And yes. that ties into the elbow position, which was going to be my next question, but which you touched on. Cause of course what you right. see all the time in, uh, in your, your everyday gyms are people, mostly guys putting too much weight on the, on the bar, on the bench, and then flaring their elbows up to uh, as close to 90 degrees right. as they can to try to grind out and those last couple reps. And that's how you that's unproductive in races. the long run. It's unproductive in the long yeah. run. There's a little, there's a surgical procedure called the Mumford procedure that uh, will eventually be necessary if you keep doing that. Uh, it's best to hold the elbows down and arch the chest up. If you flare the elbows up into 90 degrees, I understand that that pulls all of the pec into the movement. It adds the delts. It's easier to bench heavier weights like that. That's absolutely true. But it's not good for your shoulders. And you ought to be taking a narrower grip than that. And you need to be very careful about arching the chest up so that you can do that nice vertical bar path with your elbows down a little bit because it that's how you take care of your shoulders. And you got to pay attention, especially if you're new, uh, you sure. got to pay attention to that, especially when you get to your, you know, if you're working at a, uh, if, uh, if you're lifting heavier weights and, and, and working close ish to failure, those last couple reps, when, when you know you're that's when you hurt yourself focusing. yeah you're really focused on trying to get that weight up and it's easy to for for the elbows to float up just as a natural instinctive way to recruit a little bit more power but that's just where it takes the presence of mind a little bit of discipline of technique to keep your elbows where they need to be and uh don't don't use that as the you know the crutch for finishing the set right Exactly. Right, so I think, <laughs> and that's really, if, if those of you that are real interested in this, uh, I can't recommend this enough. I'm, I'm not just trying to sell my book, but we're the only resource that illustrates this concept. And you, you can see exactly what we're talking about. Uh, just get the blue book, Starting Strength, Basic Barbell Training, third edition. It shows you exactly what we're talking about. It's hard to visualize just with me and Mike here talking about it, but look it up. Agreed. I mean, it's uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna train with a barbell, starting training is a book that you should have gone through. Uh, anyway, that should be the first thing you go through, in my opinion. Right. All right. So let's move on. I think those are, those are the main points I had for bench press. I think we can move on to overhead press. Um, and my first question for you on uh, overhead is seated versus standing. Always standing. And so, do you think? Do you think there is no reason? I see no reason to do a seated press. Really? Well, if you're an amputee. <laughs> I'm not being funny. I mean, if you're, if you've gotten, uh, if you've come back from a uh, military deployment and your legs are gone through no fault of your own, then you're going to have to do a seated press. But if you've got both your legs and you're doing a seated press, you're, you're just being a pussy. What if, what if stand up and press the barbell overhead? Use your whole body. Be happy you have your legs. Use them. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't understand. I, I really honor them. Yes, honor. absolutely. Honor your legs by making them part of your pressing. They want to help you. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah. let me let me. So, what are your thoughts on seated? Uh, you can obviously put up more weight, which you could argue is. I don't. Th I doubt that at all. No, I don't agree with that at all. I mean, I. Unless you've, if, if you have learned how to seated press and you, you, you basically what you've done is learn how to do a very high angle inclined bench press. All right. But using, uh, 
the correct pressing technique, like we teach, a dynamic start off your shoulders, you should be able to press more weight that way. And if you can't, you just haven't learned. But you, you should be able to press more weight overhead standing than hmm. seated. Okay. And that's probably a technical thing because I've, Absolutely. I've, uh, yeah, is, I've, yes. I've pressed, I would say seated about 20 pounds more than, than standing, but that's probably a technical point then. It is. That's a pretty good seated press, Mike, but I'm, uh, I, if you learn how to do a correct standing press and I'm sitting here looking at a painting I have on the wall of, uh, that is a, a rendition of a photograph of Tommy Suggs pressing uh, from back in the 60s. That picture is on the first page of the press chapter in the blue book. Uh, you can see exactly what, uh, when, when, when you do a correct press, your chest is actually pointing at the ceiling. And you start it with the motion of your hips, not your knees, but your hips. You do a little, you learn to do a little hip kick. And this gets the bar started up off the shoulders without the extreme amount of help that a, that a knee kick push press would have. And once you learn how to do, and once again, like I mentioned earlier, this is an athletic movement. It, it's, it's technique dependent. It has to be practiced. And uh, practice at lightweight does not constitute practice at heavyweight because the uh, mechanics of the motion changes as the weight on the bar goes up. Yeah. You have to practice doing heavy presses. Yeah. You know, thinking it, th actually looking at it when I was just my own experience, I, if I look at it, I don't think I was getting uh, my chest quite where it needed to be on to that, 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 that alone could have explained some of the difference actually yes. between the, the seated and the standing. Yeah. You, you, you kind of want to think about it like you're doing an incline, you know, like your chest is actually pointing. Right. So in other words, you're going to use quite a bit of thoracic extension in order to get your chest up because that is the position that gets the most weight off of your shoulders because you want to use your pecs. All right. And then as the bar passes the top of your head, you get under the bar. But you launch the barbell up off of your chest with a hip movement, and the position is stronger if the chest is facing the ceiling. Right. And you can see that position very, very clearly in the picture of Suggs as he's pressing this big weight up over here. Yeah, if, if uh, people I'm listening, sure. if you just Google Tommy Suggs. Just embed that picture in your brain, man. Yep, Suggs that's, that's 2G press, and then you'll see uh, you'll see what Mark's talking about. Yeah, it's a, it's a great picture. Great picture. It's uh, That picture alone is worth a lot of coaching. Yeah, just because it's a, that's go there. there. Em emulate that. Yes. And put yourself on camera and see if you can do it. Yes, absolutely. Let's talk about the hip drive. That's obviously one of the things on my list because um, it's often misunderstood. And it's, right. I, I found it a little bit tricky to get used to. It is. Again, it's complicated. And the way we teach it at the seminar is we have, uh, we'll have the person stand there with their hands on their hips, just arms akimbo, hands on your hips. And we'll, we'll, tell, we'll tell you to tighten up your abs and your quads. So that there is a band of tension from your chin all the way down to the floor. You're, you're tightening the anterior front, just the front of your body, the whole, the abs, quads, everything is tight. And then you're going to push your hips forward into that tension. If you stay tight, it is the equivalent of drawing a bow because you're pushing into the tension and the further you push into that tension, the more resistance you meet. And what you have to learn how to do is push into that tension to create a rebound. All right. Now, if the bar is sitting on your shoulders and you go from a straight vertical line down the abs and the, and the thighs into a curve, then the position of the barbell will drop a little bit, about an inch. 
just because you went from a straight line to a curved line. You see the geometry of that, right? Right. So what you're going to do is stand there with a the bar in your hands. You're going to push your hips quickly. You're going to push your hips forward. The bar is going to come down. And then as the hips come back out of the tension, the bar jumps up a little bit. So you're going to create a little bounce in the position of the bar. The bounce is caused by the change in the length of the vertical line, caused by the curve as you push into the deal, into the into the tension of the hips and abs. Right. As you, as you from, that, from that convex position back toward a... Right. Straight. Exactly. And then the bar jumps back up. So what you do is, in the way we teach this, it's easy to learn if you, if you teach it like this. We put the empty bar in the hands, and we make the bar jump up a couple of times. And then we say hips and press. So you're going to catch the momentum as the bar comes up off the shoulders and press through it and lock it out. And once you do it once, you do it once like that, you say, oh, okay. And then, and then the timing is easy. Now, you have to make sure you're not unlocking your knees because you leak power out of unlocked knees. Right. And you have to make sure you're not doing a down and up push press. This, is a, this movement turns a forward and back, a horizontal hips movement into vertical bar movement. Makes sense. And then it's just, then it's just timing. And it's just and it's practice. It's timing and practice after that. But once you once most people see how this works with an empty bar, then you can you get the timing down. It feels natural to them. It's it's a kind of a fun movement to do because it's athletic, and it really helps with the press. A strict military press done without any torso movement at all doesn't handle a lot of weight. And that's that. That was one of my next questions for you. So, but this 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 is kind of an Olympic press. This is what we. This is how we informally refer to this, is the Olympic press, or the, some of the geeks call it press two point uh, But this is really an Olympic press. It's a press using a hips movement, not a knees movement, a hips movement to start the bar out of the out of the bottom. You can handle more weight like this, and unlike. A push press, and good push pressers can add thirty percent to the weight they can press because they can get enough leg out of it to drive a whole lot more weight up. This doesn't add that that much to the press, and a push presser, an effective push presser, doesn't even really start pressing on the bar till it's about its forehead. This one is not that radical. But it does add a whole bunch of muscle mass, and it, so it satisfies our criteria by involving more of the body in the movement, right? While still retaining all of the characteristics of an actual press, you're pressing the whole range of motion. You're getting a little help from your hips as it starts off your shoulders, and this is an an extremely effective compromise for lifting more weight with more of your body than a strict press would provide. Let's talk about that next, just for people that have heard. So well, how does this compare to, to military press or strict press? What, are, what, how, what do these terms mean? Well, a military press is a, is a press performed without any torso movement. Okay. It's hard to do. I mean, you've got to get your chin out of the way. Yep. You know, I haven't ever actually seen a correct military press performed because uh, the criteria it, you ought to what the way I've heard it described is you ought to be able to press leaning against a wall <laughs> with your back against a wall, your heels and back against the wall. You just go through your face, man. Yeah. So in other words, you're going to produce a curved bar path that goes out around your chin. That's not good mechanics because good pressing mechanics is a vertical bar path for all the mechanical reasons we discuss in the book. So I, I don't see a point in even you're supposed to kind playing of like, like we're doing a military press. Away a little bit and like, you know, yeah, and if, the, if your head's against the wall, you can't pull it away. Right. You know, so at, at any practical level, you don't really have what is a strict press anyway. 
Now you can move, you can lay your head back and get out of the way and not use any hip movement. And that's probably the closest you're going to get yeah. to a strict press. I've done that seated. But you can do it seated, you know, because you don't have your hips available to you when you're seated. Right. Right. So we want you to stand there and actively use your abs and your hips and your quads and your calves and your shoulders and your traps. And here's another important point. When you lock a press out overhead, the load is on your traps. The, tri the triceps straighten out the elbow and hold the elbow locked. But at lockout, the load is on your traps. So every correct press finishes with a shrug. Yep. You've got to remember, remember to shrug at the top of the press. And why, why is it's that? not locked out. Yeah, why is that important? Because you want to keep from impinging the shoulder joint. Right. Because the shrug rotates the scapulas medially and superiorly and pulls the AC joint away from the head of the humerus. See, this is the hilarious part about popular culture and the press. What is it that every physical therapist in uh, the Northern Hemisphere will tell you about the press? Wait. Oh, it's, it impinges the shoulders. Yeah, it chews up your shoulders. No, no, it doesn't. In fact, it's anatomically impossible for a correct press to chew up the shoulders. I've had both of my shoulders operated on for various reasons, and I can press perfectly comfortably. And in, in fact, if you go to my website, you can see a video that I have done about shoulder rehab after rotator cuff surgery that uses the press movement as the primary rehab driver. And it works. And a physical therapist that tells you not to press because it impinges your shoulders doesn't understand either the press or the shoulder. And that's obviously also uh, it, a common it, that's a common charge level of the bench press too. Is that it always chews up yeah. your shoulders all the time? Uh, it, it doesn't have to. Frequently, it does. It's far harder on the shoulders than the press is. Because obviously the, the, you are trapped between the bench and the barbell and what's in the middle, the shoulder. Right. Well, you're never trapped under a press. If you miss a press, the bar comes down. Right. And if you finish the top of the press with a shrug, you will not impinge the shoulder. It's anatomically impossible. This is also illustrated in the book. All of these considerations have been, have been dealt with in the book. And if, if, you receive advice to not press because it's going to tear your shoulders up. I'm sorry, guys. You've just gotten some bad advice. Bad advice is everywhere. All right. Educate yourself about the anatomy and about how the press should be performed. But you didn't even, I, I know you don't remember this, Mike, because you're just a kid, but 40 years ago, there wasn't any rotator cuff surgery. Nobody had a rotator cuff operation 40 years ago when people pressed. Everybody press makes healthy shoulders. It makes healthy shoulders. Yes, that's exactly the opposite of what most of you people have been told. But I'm telling you, the press makes healthy shoulders. Don't believe somebody that tells you not to press because they're damaging for your shoulders. Because they're not. They're not damaging for your shoulders. They're good for your shoulders. They make your shoulders strong, and they prevent shoulder injuries. Isn't it interesting how people are wrong sometimes? <laughs> Say, similar to, to the deadlift and what it does for your back. Oh, when, yeah. When, yeah. Well, deadlift. Hey, you got back pain? Oh, God, don't deadlift. Oh, God, I'll tear your back up. It'll shear your spine into. Shoot vertebrae you know, like straight out. <laughs> out against, you know, little bloody spots on the wall from people's vertebrae being launched across, you know, and, and, and what's the actual truth? The actual truth is we take people with chronic back pain and we have deadlift and squat for two weeks and their back pain's gone. Magical mysteries. 
That's the truth. That's the truth. That's what actually occurs. Right. Okay. Just because your back hurts doesn't mean that using your back is going to make it hurt more. And we probably ought to do a, a back pain show one of these days too. Mike. Could be interesting. Can, yeah. Cause I mean, we covered the deadline we talk about in that. detail in the previous, but, uh, any sort of, and I think we touched on it, but we we really ought to talk just about back pain. Yeah, one that actually be a I great, that'd be, that'd be a great follow. Really useful for a lot of your listeners to 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 let's get into this and talk about the epidemiology of back pain, why people's backs hurt, why they don't hurt, what makes them hurt, what makes them not hurt, what doesn't make them hurt, and and just kick that around a little bit. I think that'd be real informative. I bet you'll have people. Uh, asking you for that. They'll probably uh, want follow ups after this comment, I'm sure. Yeah. And for, for anything, to, anything related to pain, uh, there's a lot of obviously a lot of interest out there because yeah. if you have some pain, sure. that's where you're up uh, late at night on on the Googles trying to figure it out because it's, uh, it's annoying. Well, I, I think probably fully half of the questions that we get on our forum are about injuries. Yeah. Yeah, elbow stuff. And that's that's been the case for 10 years. Shoulder stuff, back stuff, knee stuff. Everything. Yep. Everything. People are concerned about hurting. I understand that. I understand that. But so often things are not what you think. And so often the people we trust to know this shit, doctors, don't have the slightest idea about it. They have the slightest idea about it. Any doctor that puts you on opiate analgesics for chronic back pain, should lose his license. That, that's, and I'm dead serious about that. Deadly serious about that. You've got a whole bunch of people running around, you know, the nation's opioid epidemic. Yep. You know where that came from? It came from back pain and from doctors prescribing opiate analgesics for back pain. That is irresponsible. And it has caused lots and lots of problems for lots and lots of people. And the problem is, is they don't know what the hell they're doing. They don't know what causes back pain. They've never thought about it. And they don't understand how to make it go away. And we do. And you and I are going to have fun on that show. I look forward so to it. I look let, forward to it. Let's plan that. Let's do it. Oh, um, I think, I mean, those are all the, those are all the major questions that I had. Um, I think we should just, uh, well, and this is about as long as anybody can stand to listen to us talk anyway. So oh, this is going to, people are going to complain. They'd be like, Oh, what the fuck? This was 60 minutes. What? Yeah, I know. You know, they'll listen to Rogan for two hours and 45 minutes, but you and I <laughs> we're just considered talk for 45 minutes, man, you guys droned on and on and on. <laughs> I think it's been good information. Yeah, we're not as uh, cool as Rogan, unfortunately. No, and we never will be. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I can live with it. All right, well, let's wrap up uh, just in case if anyone listening, if uh, they, they, I'm sure they've come across you in Europe, but in case they haven't, uh, what's the- We're at startingstrength.com. Central hub, startingstrength.com. And- startingstrength.com, enormous website, getting bigger every day, new content, seven days a week, goes up about noon every day, brand new or articles that you have not seen before, every day at noon, brand new content, stuff to talk about, forums to discuss all this stuff, videos, lectures, articles, instruction, all that stuff. Books available there or at Amazon.com. Starting strength, basic barbell training, practical programming for strength training. Those are both in third edition. And I appreciate the, the time. Uh, Mike, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time. It's a pleasure as always. Anytime, man. We'll see you next time. All righty. Hey there, it's Mike again. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it interesting and helpful. And if you did and don't mind doing me a favor, then please do give this video a like and leave a comment down below. Not only do I like to hear from everybody and I jump in and reply to as many comments as I can, it also helps other people find their way to the show and learn how to build their best bodies ever too. And of course, if you wanna be notified when the next episode goes live, then just subscribe to my channel and you won't miss out on any of the new content. Lastly, if you didn't like something about the show, then definitely shoot me an email at mike at musclelife.com and share your thoughts on how you think it could be better. I read everything myself and I'm always looking for constructive feedback. So please do reach out. Thanks again for listening to the episode and I hope to hear from you soon.
Oh, and before you leave, let me quickly tell you about one other product of mine that I think you might like. Specifically, my fitness book for women, Thinner, Leaner, Stronger. Now, this book has sold over 300,000 copies in the last several years, and it has helped thousands of women build their best bodies ever, which is why it currently has over 1,500 reviews on Amazon with a four and a half star average. So if you want to know the biggest lies and myths that keep women from ever achieving the lean, sexy, strong, and healthy bodies they truly desire, and if you want to learn the simple science of building the ultimate female body, then you want to read Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, which you can find on all major online retailers like Audible, Amazon, iTunes, Kobo, and Google Play. Now, I should also mention that you can get the audiobook 100% free when you sign up for an Audible account, which I highly recommend that you do if you are not currently listening to audiobooks. I myself love them because they let me make the time that I spend doing things like commuting, prepping food, walking my dog, and so forth more valuable and productive. Now, if you want to take Audible up on this offer and get my audiobook for free, simply go to www.thinnerleanerstronger.com slash audiobook, and you will be forwarded to Audible. And then just click on the sign up today and save button, create your account, and voila, you get to listen to Thinner, Leaner, Stronger for free.